Good morning, everyone. It's 1045. I'm going to get started. So welcome to day two of DrupalCon. I'm glad that you chose to join me for this session. And I really hope that that doesn't happen again. OK. Don't touch the cord. Um, so this talk is called Don't Trust Your Gut Agency Operations Metrics. So we're going to go over some of the metrics that I track in my role as, as Chief Operating Officer at BlueSpark. Um, so I track these things to make sure that everything is running smoothly. Uh, that's kind of, in a nutshell, what operations is, keeping everything running. Um, so we're going to spend quite a bit of time looking at some spreadsheets. So I hope that you're all prepared for that. I have posted the links of them over there because the screen is a little small. So I just want to make sure that you can see the detail. It may be easier to follow along on your own computer. Um, first, though, we'll get into just kind of why did I do this before I jump into the spreadsheets and start actually sharing how it all works. So first, I'd like to tell you just a little bit more about myself. So we're going to go over the metrics of me. I am 13,006 days old today. I've read five books so far in 2018. I average 6.3 hours of sleep per night. It's not enough. And I dance 4.5 hours per week. That's, again, an average. Sometimes I skip a class. Uh, I do about four hours of cooking every week. I love to cook. And zero hours of commuting because I work in a distributed agency. Um, so where have I spent my life? This is a super fancy pie chart that shows you the percentage of my lifetime that I've spent in different cities. I was born in Milwaukee, grew up in Janesville, Wisconsin. It's a fascinating place, so you definitely don't need to go there. Uh, then I lived in Bourges, France for a year, in Paris for 14 years, and Chicago uh, for five, and that's where I live now. Okay. I, have, uh, I have two children with a one-to-one -one ratio of boy to girl. And I have uh, been married to my husband for 50% of the time I have known him. I have spent one third of my career at BlueSpark. And now I have spent about 1.5 minutes of this presentation on some meaningless metrics. So let's move on to more important things. So why were those personal metrics kind of meaningless? It was because I wasn't really giving you a whole lot of context. So to tell you I've been married to my husband for half the time that I have known him is not really the same thing if we've been married for five years or 40. That would be a very long time to know somebody. Um, so you know, the, the context is really what makes the data meaningful. I'm going to share spreadsheets with you. And these, the, the oh, sorry. The numbers and, and the data that is in those spreadsheets can give you part of the story, but you definitely are going to need more context and more analysis to really understand what's going on. It can tell you where you need to be looking and what might need some tweaking in, in your agency, but it's never going to tell the whole story. So to help you understand a little bit of the context around the metrics that I track at BlueSpark and what's in these sheets, I need to tell you just a little bit about BlueSpark because the metrics that I track may not be useful for you know, your situation. So <clears throat> BlueSpark was founded in 2009. We have a current team size of about 20 people. We have both in-house design and development. Um, we do time and materials billing. So pretty much every hour logged is an hour invoiced. Um, and we have had growth of 61% in terms of revenue and 50% in terms of team size than, since 2015. So why 2015? I'd like to take it all back to TripleCon LA 2015. Sorry, I think I skipped one, didn't I? Yep. Um, so at TripleCon LA, I attended a session by Sean Larkin. It was entitled, Scaling Your Business Starts with the Right Spreadsheets Performance Metrics. So at the time, BlueSpark didn't really have much in the way of metrics. We were definitely just using the trust your gut method to plan for our growth. And we knew that we wanted to grow. We didn't have necessarily much of a plan how. And we didn't really have the numbers to analyze, well, what would it take to get there? So 
I am somebody who likes numbers in general, and I and like to make data-driven decisions. And I also really like spreadsheets. So Sean's talk really inspired me to take some of the tools that he shared and apply them to our agency. The tools that he shared aim to answer questions like, what is the right volume and mix of client projects to afford hiring staff? What's the weighted value of all work under contract plus likely new business? What's your billable hours target for a particular month based upon staff availability, training, and internal resource needs? And what's your projected effective billing rate for the next six months? So his talk is awesome. I'm not going to try and rehash the entire thing for you. Um, but I have linked to it there in the, the title of, of this slide. Um, so if you haven't seen it, please go and watch it. It's really great. He goes into a lot of detail about how he built the spreadsheets. I'm going to walk you through just really quickly what his spreadsheets do because I've built on it. But you know, for the full detail, you definitely should watch his talk. It's really great. And you know, very much worth your time. His talk was focused more on pipeline, agency health, and scaling. He was in a different role than, than I am. He was a CEO. So, you know, what he was trying to do was really look at the overall health of his company and plan for the growth that he, that he wanted to, to see. Uh, and he was really also focused, yeah, on, on pipeline, on making sure, you know, CEOs, when you're in smaller agencies, are often really focused still in sales. So the sales pipeline was incorporated in what he was doing as well. Um, so you'll see that I've adapted his, his tools to kind of skew them more towards operations. So more specifically, projecting the work that we have, resourcing it, and then measuring the performance for a professional services team. Um, so I am going to, like I said, quickly walk you through his stuff, but not going into all the detail, since he did a good job of that already in his talk. So the two tools that he shared and that I built upon were the billable hours matrix, uh, and the links that I provided are like my versions of these things. The original links can be found in his talk. Uh, so what the billable hours matrix does, it is you can set your rate and your uh, monthly expenses, and I know this is super small, it wasn't intended for you to be able to get in there and see what was going on. Um, you can set your rate, set your monthly expenses, and just kind of play with those numbers to see what does this do to my profit, to my and to my revenue for the year. It um, allows for you to plan for maximum billable utilization, so with your team working and billing every single hour of the day, every single week, and then realistic billable utilization, because that's not realistic to expect that of people. People take vacation, people get sick, they attend conferences, they spend time in internal meetings, they spend time contact switching. So he has it set up so that you can say essentially how many hours per week somebody would spend on all of those activities and then give them a more realistic target for billable hours. It then compares uh, your revenue, profit, and uh, total hours billed uh, between the realistic and the maximum billable rates for your team. There's another tab in there that allows you to plan for team growth where you can add you know, new roles over the course of the year at specific months. You can uh, plan for their salaries um, and also see what that does uh, to your profit um, and to your revenue, which is calculated in a separate tab, as we'll see. Um, and then you can also plan for events. So, you know, there's a week, like, maybe over the holidays, most of your team is gone, so you can add uh, deviations to say, okay, well, we're going to lose 300 billable hours this month because everybody's gone or this, yeah, that month, because everybody's gone one week during that month. So that's the billable hours matrix, short version. Um, the second spreadsheet that he shared is called under contract. So this one was really looking at your current work runway. It lists all of your projects. Um, and it has basically like how many billable hours are in the project, um, who is working on it. And then he also had uh, the sales pipeline added in there, so work that was not yet signed, with weighted values of how likely it was to close. So in that way, he could calculate, okay, if you know 50% of the sales pipeline is going to close, how much work am I going to have coming up? 
and, and try and project you know, his, his, his upcoming work that way. Um, so yeah, it calculates the value and the timeline for your existing portfolio and then it calculates future workload based on likelihood to, likelihood to close of the sales pipeline. So as I said, I've adapted these things. The billable hours matrix is something, um, I really use it more for just uh, annual planning. So it's something that like in September I'll start to put together for the next year to plan for team growth, plotting out like what our goals should be, um, when can I add to the team, what roles might I need, how much can I afford to pay these people, um, and determining what my sales targets need to be to fill my team's capacity. That part ties in to the other document though. There's some overlap from you know, the data that, um, but so what I've added to this, uh, it's not that much. His tool was really awesome. I've basically added just a section that uh, calculates the potential revenue per role. So just looking at somebody in a UX role, a uh, development role, design role, with their uh, total reasonable or realistic billable hours for a year, how much revenue would that person bring in? Um, and then revenue and profit at different utilization rates. We'll see that in a second. It's just that I can't screen share and show you guys slides at the same time. So we will walk through all that in a minute. Um, for the adaptations to under contract, uh, so this one, as I said, my role is different from Sean's. So his was much more an overview and he was bringing in sales pipeline. Um, I don't do that. So I'm not looking at all at things that are in the sales pipeline. I've removed that from under contract. I'm only looking at contracted work. Um, so what I'm really trying to get into as you know, COO is more of the nitty gritty details of operations. So I had to give this spreadsheet the capability to tell me at a glance how booked my team is, um, how are we performing, and how much revenue can we expect, expect month over month. So I modified this one quite a bit, and we call it internally the mega sheet. Um, this one, you know, I said the other spreadsheet I use like on an annual basis, it's more for annual planning. This one I update weekly. So it really, like I lay everything out for the year, but then I fine tune it and update it um, because things change on projects. You know, timelines sometimes shift for many, many reasons that I'm sure you've all encountered. Um, somebody's availability may change. Maybe a contract is extended. You know, maybe the client is waiting for, you know, stakeholder alignment and meetings aren't happening when they need to and things just kind of get pushed back. Many re for many reasons, uh, you know, projections may need to be updated because things change. So I'm often in here updating it and trying to keep the data fresh. I use the spreadsheet to calculate many things. Um, basically, I, I calculate actuals, utilization rate, the value of all of our current accounts, timeline and budget for all current accounts, uh, velocity needed to complete projects on time, remaining budget on projects, projected work for the year, projected revenue for the year. So some of the questions that I can answer uh, with the mega sheet, and I'll come, I'll circle back to these at the end once we've like walked through it, um, is will my current team configuration be able to complete the work that we have lined up? Uh, how many people do I need to assign to this project to complete it on time? How much available capacity does my team have? How utilized is my team? How did my team perform last month compared to projections? How much revenue will my company bring in in future quarters with the signed portfolio? <coughs> and how much additional sales do I need to close to bill at capacity in future quarters? So we're gonna get into the spreadsheets now. Careful. Um, these are just the links that I have posted up there because the screen is small, I'm not sure how much you'll be able to see once I start screen sharing. So I just wanted to get those up there for a second. You can pull them up and follow on. Yes? Just in the, the last character on the one that you have up on the wall looks like an I. It's an L. It's an L. That's totally my fault. I thought it was an I, I'm sorry. Okay, so that's an L and it's lowercase and I misread it. Sorry, 
thank you for pointing that out. Everybody would have been not looking at the right thing. Okay, so I'm going to exit out of here. I'm gonna start mirroring, so now you get to see my entire, okay. All right, that might be. All right, I think we're gonna try and work with this. Okay, so this is the first sheet. This is a billable hours matrix. Kind of explained a little bit, you know, how this works already. This, again, is mostly taken from Sean. I use it for the annual planning and have just added a few things to it. So I told, I said at the beginning that you can figure out you can kind of play with your rate here and with your expenses. Expenses are right there. So, you know, changing those numbers is going to affect the, all of the calculations and the formulas for profit, revenue, things like that that are in this sheet. But what this gives you is a list of your team. Here, sorry, I'm gonna try and highlight things as I go. So these are the team, uh, the, the different roles that they're in, and then you have the number of hours that they are working per week, because maybe you have people who are part-time. And then all of this here, so this whole section is figuring out that, utiliz that realistic utilization. So, you know, is somebody spending two hours per week in internal calls and three hours per week contributing? Like, this is where you would uh, lay all of that out to figure out what a realistic target is for this person. And then at the bottom, you have totals. Um, it just basically pulls all those numbers together, crunches them, and tells you like what your uh, maximum revenue, maximum profit, maximum profit margin would be weekly, monthly, annually, and what the realistic version of those numbers are because you know, people aren't machines and they don't bill 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year. So that's the first tab. That first tab is all the mechanics that feeds into the rest of the document. So the second tab is uh, revenue targets. So it takes all of those wonderful people on your team and it pulls their realistic target from the previous tab and then it uh, assumes that they're you know, billing the, that number of hours per month. So it just lays out each of your months here with you know, the number of hours that that person is billing. You have a row here for deviations, so that's where you can say, oh, we're all going to DrupalCon, so we need to remove you know, some time from that month. Um, and then you get your totals with you know, total hours that your team is available, how much they are booked. Booked is something that I added, and that is being pulled from the mega sheet. That's where I'm calculating how booked they are. Um, then booked revenue, so just times your rate, how much revenue is that booking worth. Uh, and then you have what your revenue would be at full capacity. So were they booked to capacity, what your revenue would be. And then we have a line for uh, including a 20% rate that we charge for uh, project management and account management. So then you get your total annual revenue. This little section here is something that I added that's just uh, calculating what your potential revenue is for specific roles in, in the agency. So that can help when you're trying to you know, plan for, for growth and add in new people, which is part of what this, uh, this tab is for. You can see at the bottom there's new hires where they're you know, planned to begin in April. Um, so you can add people in and, and then see you know, how that affects your revenue to suddenly have 140 additional billable hours in a month for that person. Um, so then the third tab, profit targets, this one is now looking at all that revenue that you just brought in from the first tab and it's subtracting your expenses. So you have just your monthly expenses at the top. Um, after that you have then a monthly salary for every person on the team. Um, obviously none of this is real data that I'm sharing with you. Um, and then at the bottom you have your totals. So projected costs per month your projected revenue that's being pulled from the previous tab, 
projected profit, projected profit margin. What I've added here and what I found useful um, to calculate in this is what happens to your revenue, your profit, and your profit margin at different utilization rates. Because while we are being realistic with our targets, you know, life does happen. Sometimes that project that you thought was a sure deal doesn't end up happening or, you know, so you may end up with some downtime during the year. We all know that agency life is not steady. It's kind of can be a little up and down. Um, so this is just if your average utilization rate for the entire year is 98 percent. So and by that would be 98 percent of the realistic target, not 98 percent of like maximum. So calculating based on, for us, 30 hours per week of billable time, not 40. Um, what does that do to your revenue? At what point are you just barely at break even? In this instance, with this you know, fake data that I put in there, um, somewhere between 80 and 85%, you start to lose money. So then the fourth tab. And this is one that I've added completely. This was not in here before, but this was also something that was kind of calculated since sales pipeline was in the other document. It was there um, in Sean's version. So this just pulls in from the other tabs, deviations. Uh, so things that are, you know, events that are affecting availability in specific months. Then the total number of available hours that you have, how much of that time is booked, uh, what your sales target is in hours to hit capacity and your monthly sales target. Uh, so how much like unbooked revenue you have. So it would it doesn't do me any good to sell twenty two thousand dollars in January. That's too late because what this is telling me is my sales target about two months before that should be twenty two thousand dollars so that in January I can do twenty two thousand dollars worth of work that I don't currently have booked. So it then it gives you then your annual sales target. For this team, it's $222,000. Again, a $222,000 sale in December isn't gonna help me very much. Like that'll be really nice for 2019, but it doesn't help this team hit their capacity this year. Okay, so now we're gonna move into the mega sheet. Uh, so mega sheet, the first tab of this uh, is kind of the, the data, the project data that then gets, that, that I then use for the, the resourcing and the projections. Um, so what this is, you have a list of all projects. It's divided into different sections. So all projects with the, you have client name, what the project is about, you know, project like title. And then, oh, sorry, I'm, there we go, that's better. Um, and then there's just a brief section with the different people who are assigned to the team. And then you get into the timeline section. So timeline is here. Um, so the timelines that I'm using here are for projections. I'm trying to plan and resource projects, trying to look at an overall portfolio of projects. This is not from a project management perspective. I'm not, you know, actually working actively on these projects and trying to make sure, you know, that all of these tickets are completed on time. That's a whole other level of planning that needs to happen beyond this. So this is kind of the, you know, bigger picture version of this portfolio of projects. Let's get them planned out and more or less figure out when the work is getting done. Um, so the way this works, when I add a new project, um, I would add in then the start date when we you know, expect to start, the end date, so for each phase. So project start date here, sorry, UX completion date, because I'm assuming that there's UX on this project. If there's, you know, if there's not, then you would just jump to production. Uh, and then UI start date, UI completion date, production start date, production com completion date. So it's basically your rough timeline for each project phase. So I would add that here, and then this next little section, weeks to complete, is calculated with a magical formula where it looks at those two dates and it says, oh, between you know, April 1st and April 30th, there are four weeks. Um, and it does take into account today's date. So if today's date is April 15th, it's gonna say, no, you have two weeks left for that phase. The next section then is the contract. So 
how much money is this project worth. So you would fill in your rates. You would fill in then, or I fill in, uh, how many hours are for each phase? So how many hours do I have for UX? How many hours do I have for UI? How many hours do I have for production? If there's you know, no design, as I said, we have design on our team, but maybe this project doesn't have design, you just fill in the production hours. That then is going to calculate the total value of your contract over here. So I do not go in there and say this is a $100,000 project. I just fill in the rate, how many hours, and it calculates that part for me. Then you have time logged. So time logged is the number of billable hours, again, for each project phase in JIRA. These are not pulled directly from JIRA. I pull them manually. It really doesn't take me that long. Um, and I add them to the actuals tab that we'll look at later. So these are being pulled from the actuals tab from tab three. Um, but it's just basically the total number of hours that have been logged for each of those phases. Then you get the total number of hours and the other really cool magical formula that uh, tells you what the velocity to complete is for each phase. So this is looking at the number of hours that you have left and the number of weeks that you have left from those previous sections and calculating how many hours you need to log per week to get through that work on time. And then it's also calculating remaining budget. Sorry, that's this column right there based on the hours that have been logged in this section right here. Okay, so that's all the data that's then going into the next part. This is where it gets really fun, I promise. Um, okay, I'm going to zoom out though because I would like to first kind of let you see how much is in this. Okay, there we go. This is the entire mega sheet, almost. Um, so, what's going on in this thing? This here is the project. So each of these little sections right here this is one project, and this here is the project data. And I will zoom back in, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> um, so it's the project title, the different people who are assigned to the project for each specific phase, and it's pulling in from the previous tab the dates for those phases and the number of hours from the velocity, so the number of hours that I have to log per week to complete this thing on time. Each of these columns represents one week out of the year. So I go in and I will add in, like I basically plan out the team. Uh, so if I need you know, 100 hours on a project and I have three, maybe three and a half people working on it, you know, I put in those four, uh, the four people here and then I would add hours in the corresponding weeks. Like if one person's gonna be working 15 hours, so I said it's three and a half, and then the other three are working 30, I would add you know, 15, 30, 30, 30 spread it out for the duration of the project. I'll zoom back in to show you how that works. But so each week where you see a number, that means somebody's working. Those are you know, hours that we project to work and to log and bill. Okay, so these are just then all the projects and if you, when you get down to the bottom, you get your totals. So this is where your analysis can happen. So the totals, you have uh, each team member and this is every single, you know, it's totaling how many hours they are projected to work or planned to work for each week of the year. I have color coding that I will explain when I zoom back in, but the color coding is really what helps me see things at a glance. And I'm very, very sorry if anyone is colorblind, it is not accessible for that. Um, so booked versus capacity is then in the section beneath that, so it's just analyzing how much people are booked versus their capacity. There's a section then with revenue projections, so taking all those hours that are planned and multiplying it times our rate to get us you know, projected revenue that we would bring in. And then the bottom section is a comparison to the actuals, which are in the next tab. So, okay, I'm gonna go back up to the top. I'm gonna zoom back in because I know it's a little scary, the super zoomed out version where you can't really see anything. There we go, okay. So, we're gonna look at a couple of projects. 
Um, so as I said, this is all getting pulled in from, from the other sheet, and I'm using this part to actually, or from the other tab, sorry, from the first tab. And this then is just used to actually plan out the work and, and the team. So I wanna use this one as my example. So, because it hasn't started yet, so it makes it a little bit easier to use as my example. Okay, so I can see here that for the UX phase of my project, uh, it needs to begin May 1st, it needs to end June 1st, so I have about four weeks for it, and I need to log 18.67 hours to get through the total number of hours that I have for that phase. So, I've assigned it to David, David R. Um, from my, my list of UX people. And he's then gonna be working you know, 18.5 hours for those four weeks. And you can see that matches up to May 6th. Okay. Then, you know, same thing for UI, same thing for development. For the development team, uh, in this instance, uh, it's a little bit different because there's, there's more hours than one person can do. So I have to add a couple of rows and then assign to the different people on the team who will be doing that work. So in this instance, you know, there's 93.3 hours per week. So I've planned for 30 per person. You know, things always deviate just a little bit from the plan. It doesn't mean that we'll have, you know, probably an extra week of work for one person at the end. Um, but yeah, that's something that, you know, you would adjust as you go. It's, it's a planning tool, it's not like the law. Um, and then you may notice that here I have assigned some of the work to unknown. So sometimes I don't know who's going to do the work. Um, I am just, you know, haven't decided yet or, you know, maybe I'm waiting for another project to finish up. There could be various reasons why I don't know who's going to do the work when I'm trying to plan it out. So I do have as variables unknown front end, unknown back end. And that can also allow me to plan for kind of overflow work when I know that my team is booked and I really don't have anyone available for this, I can assign it to unknown. And if I have three projects that I've assigned to unknown, when I get to the bottom and I'm analyzing things, I know, okay, I got a problem. I have you know, way too much work for, for my team. But we'll, I'll show you that a little bit more in a minute. Um, so this is then planning for more of like a, a new, like a redesign, a, a build that's happening in multiple phases. We also work with retainer clients and some smaller uh, like maintenance support clients. So it works a little differently for them. I try to generally uh, assign one person to keep a, a steady resource. Working with that client, you know, it helps build the client relationship and the trust and they really then have a deep knowledge of the project that they're working on. I do have always a backup who's aware of the project and who can fill in, but generally it's one person. So they're a little bit easier to plan. You just you know, need to assign the person who's working on that project. And, and a lot of instances for retainer clients, uh, we would have like a monthly cap of hours, right? There's a monthly budget limit that you're working with. Uh, so you just basically spread that out evenly through the entire year. And that, that's what's happening here with these. This one's a little bit larger. There's two people on it. They're both working more or less full time for the entire year. With maintenance, um, well, smaller support projects, this is definitely where there can be a lot of difference between the plan and the actuals because a lot of, like, you know, if somebody has 20 hours a month, it doesn't really make sense to be working just a little bit each week on that. It can be a lot more efficient to, you know, maybe concentrate that work in two separate weeks. So spreading it out like this does mean that it doesn't necessarily line up with the actuals. So then, if we go down to the bottom. All right, we have our totals. So team member, the total annual hours that that person is booked, what their weekly capacity is, their average weekly booking, and then their average utilization, so based on booking. Um, and then, so these, I said earlier, this is pulling in the totals from all of the projects planned above per person. And the color coding here is red means that person is not booked at all. 
Orange means they are booked zero to 49%. Yellow means they are booked 50 to like 98%. Green, they are booked 98 to about 101. And blue means that person is totally underwater. They're booked you know, over capacity at like 101, 102. All right, so then beneath that, we have booked versus capacity. So this is just analyzing those bookings and the team's availability in different ways. Um, so you have you know, the total number of hours that the entire team is booked, the, uh, and then it's translated then into the available hours for the development team in a given week, the available hours for the design team in a given week, uh, and then the percentage that your development team is booked and the percentage that your design team is booked. So just different ways of looking at the numbers. Beneath that, we have the revenue projection. So actually taking all those bookings and multiplying it times your rate to get uh, a sense of how much revenue you would bring in with all those billable hours. Um, so these are separated out weekly. Now, you know, we've been planning all of, all of this project work on a weekly basis. Um, so you have the total per week, and then it gets pulled in for the month. Then there's the adjusted monthly revenue here. This is important because I found that there were sometimes quite large uh, differences between the actuals and my projections. And the reason was, you know, oh, some months fall, you know, over five weeks or four weeks, and it doesn't always line up with the number of days in the month. So it's just basically taking that weekly planning and adjusting for the reality of you know, monthly, uh, monthly invoicing and the fact that the days don't always fall you know, right on, on the weeks that you had planned for. Then you have the total number of monthly hours that are booked and the actuals comparison. So actuals, this. There aren't actuals yet really for April since we're only week in. Uh, so this is pulling the total, uh, the actual revenue, the actual number of billable hours from the following tab that we'll go into in just a second. Um, and then it's giving you the variance. So how accurate were your projections? I do, like I said, go back and fine tune these. I don't just plan out the work and do projections like once at the beginning of the year and then you know, oh, well, that was the plan. I don't know, I wasn't very accurate. I update this. So I have found that they're generally maybe 5% variance. Uh, it's, it's been pretty accurate and does help for planning for cash flow and things like that. All right, so then actuals. The actuals looks the same as projections because it's the exact same uh, <laughs> structure. So essentially at the beginning of, oh, except something's going on there with conditional f formatting, just ignore that and I'll fix it later. Um, so it, what I would do at the beginning of the year, I would take my projections tab once that's all ready and I would duplicate it because that way I have you know, the team assignments and things like that as they should be and all the numbers and then I would take all the numbers here and remove the values and my actuals tab is ready to go. So every week, uh, I pull all the hours from my team from Jira. Um, so I pull a report where it's basically each project and then the person and then the total number of hours that they logged in that week. And I just go through this. It really only takes like five minutes and, uh, and log how many hours each person has from Jira for the week. So these are all then the actual numbers and then when you scroll down to the bottom, you get your, uh, the actual number of hours that each person logged, the same thing with the totals, the same color coding, all the same principles apply. And then you have, I mean, what I then jump to here is what the actual revenue is for the month. I try and kind of track, like, am I still, on point, like if it's the third week of the month, how much do we have to log in this next week to hit our projection? Uh, you know, that's where I can see these things really happening is here. Um, like you can see for April, you know, the monthly revenue there is $7,000. We only have a week logged here. 
Um, but the projection is $25,000. So you know how much you have to make up at that point. Well, it's, um, then what the bottom, at the very bottom, is utilization rate. So I have all of the team members again, uh, quarterly utilization rate, and then weekly. So this pulls from their, uh, pulls from the hours that are logged above, and it basically just divides that into their, uh, their targets. So the targets that are also, um, well, they were defined in the first sheet that I showed you. That's where I would be planning that out for the year, what the realistic target is, but then they're also here. So it's pulling from here in the sheet with the weekly capacity. Um, it's important to note that I do make adjustments to the utilization rate when people are on vacation or you know if they're out for two days at a conference or something like that. Um, I then reduce their target for that week to whatever it was for the actual days they were working um, so that it doesn't count against them. I mean, essentially it helps I think, I hope, uh, morale, because you know, they're seeing that I worked really hard for those three days before I was out for a long weekend, and I still, you know, I hit my targets for those three days, so their, their utilization rate then is still 100% if they hit their target for those three days. It's not, you know, 70 because they were out. Um, and that's actually what's happening here. This would be the first week of the year there was vacation, um, so everybody was just at 100%. So, and then at the very bottom, you have your average utilization rate for your development team and for your design team. So just separating that out. So, um, I said that there were some questions that this allows me to answer. I'm gonna go through those really quickly and then I'll open things up for your questions. Um, so if I'm asking myself, will my current team configuration be able to complete all of my contracted work? So for that, I would look at my projections tab, and I would go right here to my color coding, and I can see, okay, with all the work that I have planned, this team is way underutilized. Like, yes, they're gonna be able to complete that, for sure, I probably need to sign some more contracts or I may need to look at layoffs in this instance if this is going to be a prolonged situation where I have this much red. But that's not always how things work. So I prepared a different little scenario over here for you. Um, so this team is way overbooked. This team has too much work. Uh, so you can see some people are, uh, you know, some people are underwater, they're blue, um, but not just a little bit, this, like this team has, six, this person has 60 hours assigned, 90 hours, 40 hours, you know, they're not gonna be able to complete all that work themselves. Um, one thing to note as well, when I am planning, sometimes I know that somebody is going to be underwater, like I cannot, they can't possibly do these two projects that I'm assigning to them, but when I'm, when I just, I'm adding a new project, starting to figure out the projections and, and planning for the portfolio. I kind of plan ideally, and then I would come down to the bottom and say, okay, well, yeah, it's, you know, either it confirms what I thought or it's worse than I thought, and I really need to shift that project to somebody else. Um, but at least by just kind of doing what, what I would ideally do, <laughs> um, I can then, you know, reassess the situation once I get down here. Um, and not, once I've seen the, the total number, and I'm not just trying to adjust in my head when I'm figuring out the project at the top. Um, but yeah, so this team is very busy. They have a lot of, you know, they're either all at capacity or way over capacity, and there's a bunch of hours assigned to the unknown back end and unknown front end. Um, you know, they have quite a few, you know, hours that, that well, Quite a few hours that you could be either contracting out, you know, maybe it's time to look at some freelance help, maybe it's time to look at outsourcing, um, maybe if this is a prolonged situation, you need to make a lot of hires really quickly, maybe you need to go talk to your clients and work on readjusting some of the time frames that you're working with on these projects because all that work is not going to get done in that time frame by that team. It's, it's not going to happen, that's not at all realistic. Um, okay, how many people do I need to assign uh, to a project to complete it on time? So that's the velocity, and that's what we were looking at earlier, where you can see, you know, you have 93 hours in this instance. 
uh, per week. So you just divide that by the capacity for the people who you are going to have working on it. And then, okay, well, I need to have three people working on that project if my capacity is 30 hours. Um, you know, maybe one of them only has partial availability, so maybe you're going to spread those hours over two people. You know, those are kind of the, the fine-tuning and, and the, the analysis that you do on, you know, after, after you've figured out how many people need to be assigned. Um, so how much available capacity does my team have? That's back at the bottom with our totals. And that would be all here in the booked versus capacity uh, areas. So you can see, you know, in like the week of August 5th, the development team has 108 hours available. Uh, the design team has 68 hours available. But you can see over here, you know, in October when that team is really busy, they don't have any availability. They have minus 127 hours. Plus, I will note that those hours do not pull in uh, unknown. So unknown dev, uh, front end, back end, are not accounted for in the capacity because I would throw off all the other calculations. Um, so it's actually worse than that when the team is overbooked. Um, how utilized is my team? So for utilization, I would go to the actuals tab, go down and look at the utilization rates. Um, and you know this, is, this team is not very utilized. As we saw, the planning showed that they were not going to be. Um, but some people are still a little bit underwater. We still have some people at like 110 hours, so maybe they're really, you know, working a bit of overtime on this project to get it done in, in a certain time. You know, there's, like I said, the numbers only are going to get you so far. Then you have to kind of figure out what's happening on this project. Like, why do I have people who are at 60%, but this other person's at 110? What's going on? Um, how, did my, how did my team perform last month versus the projections? So that you would look into in the projections comparison part, and that's repeated in both of the tabs. In actuals and in projections, there's the comparison pulled in. Um, so you can see that in February, this team uh, did not hit they did not ha hit their uh, expected <coughs> revenue, their adjusted monthly revenue. Uh, sorry, I'm in the actuals tab. Adjusted monthly revenue was $15,000. Uh, the projected revenue was 24000 so they were $8,000 below. Then how much revenue will my company bring in in future quarters with the current signed portfolio? So that, I would look at the projections tab. Looking down at revenue projections, you can just, um, I would just highlight the, uh, the number, sorry, adjusted monthly revenue for those three months, and then you get the sum at the bottom, $79,000 for the quarter. And it would be very, very easy to just pull that into another tab. That's one improvement that I have yet to make. But that, that is how you can assess quarterly. Um, how much additional sales do I need to close to bill at capacity in future quarters? That's pulling from the other spreadsheet, as I was showing uh, at the beginning. That's this whole tab. Um, and I do add the booked number uh, manually from, from the projections tab once that's figured out. So it's something that will come back in here and update it. Um, so those are the questions that I'm able to answer with this. Uh, I do want to go back, and where did my other thing go? Here we go. Turn off the mirroring. All right. So, if after watching all of this, you're like so excited and you want to put in place really massive spreadsheets to track your own metrics, um, you know, I did, I've given you template versions Feel free to take them, change them, do whatever you want with them to make it work for your agency and for your, your needs. Um, to get started, I would suggest starting small. It takes a lot of time to get them initially set up with your own data. So try and do it in manageable chunks and just make slow and steady progress. You know, do not take the spreadsheet and say, oh, I'm going to do this in one day because it's, it's a lot of work. You want to focus on it and make sure that you're not messing up formulas and things like that. Um, then 
you know, adapt and evolve them over time. This is what works for my agency and what I need to track in my role and with our configuration and our needs, but your needs are probably different. So, you know, if you're seeing, oh, I really need to know this specific metric and it's not in there, you know, figure out the formula that'll get you that calculation, add it to the spreadsheet and you've got it, then you can track that. Um, and then when you've done something really super cool and added to this and made, you know, a super mega sheet or something, um, come back and share it with everybody. Uh, so that is it. Thank you very much for listening to this and looking at all the spreadsheets with me. And now I'll take questions. Hey, thanks for sharing all that. It's really great. Um, I was curious on a sort of weekly basis how much time you are spending on keeping this up to date. And are the proje your project managers involved in keeping this up as well? So the project managers are involved in reporting back to me what's happening on their projects. You know, maybe a new, uh, you know, an additional PO was signed or something on a project or maybe, you know, there was an additional scope that was added or something didn't get completed on time. Whatever's happening on the project, they would report that to me so that I know that I need to go and adjust the projections accordingly and the timeline got pushed, whatever it is. Um, things definitely change and evolve on projects, but I mean, it's rarely all the projects that are changing in one week. So updating the projections, maybe half an hour in a week, it's, it's not huge. Um, it's really getting all the data there to begin with that, that's really time consuming. And then the actuals and the utilization rate, I pull the numbers, I plug them in, and then I adjust for vacation. That part takes maybe 15 minutes. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Hey there. Hi. Love all of that. That was amazing. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, uh, you're talking my language. Two questions if I can. One, do you find that the needs of the business and how you measure the business have changed as you grow and like what worked when you had 20 people in 10 projects doesn't work anymore when you have 50 people in 20 projects? Question one. Question two. We built a press spreadsheet that looks like almost exactly like that. So yay for us for being creative, but like, boy, we built the same thing. Should we have tried to look for some software off the shelf that kind of does that? Like, have you looked at professional services automation software that could do that stuff so we don't have to build it ourselves? Okay, so we're at 20. So I don't quite know how this scales and how it works once you get to 50. I mean, what I would assume is that it's still definitely a workable tool. It's just going to take you more time to set it up because you have more projects that you're adding in there. But, I mean, the analysis part that's happening down at the bottom is still probably very useful and still a good, a good like, short story <laughs> to, to get you, you know, to help you understand what's going on with your portfolio, even if you have, you know, 50 projects up above. Um, so you'd probably just end up spending more time using it, but I think it would still probably work for, for a larger team than, than what we have. Um, as far as software that's out there that does this, there's definitely software. Um, I have not actually looked at a whole lot of outside tools because I had this and this works for me. Um, and I like being able to change it and make it do what I need it to do. Um, I sometimes find that software, you know, it does most of the things that I want it to do, but not all of them. And, and here I can make it do whatever I want it to if I can just figure out the formula. So, yeah. Uh, if I can answer that question uh, for the gentleman who just asked, uh, QuickBooks has a tool and they have some add-ons that you can use that can also do that. Uh, I guess most of the agencies use QuickBooks for their accounting, so you will know your utilization rate and invoicing right there. Uh, my question is, uh, so you have two options. One is your gut instinct that you use to make decisions, and then you have this spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that once you know your data, which is utilization rate and bill rate, um, I guess apart from just pushing your sales team or looking at revenue increasing, what else am I getting from this maintaining these spreadsheets? I mean, what other decisions am I changing? Yes, I do know with a team of 10 or 20 people that what projects, how they are lined up, and what's the delivery and all that stuff. Well, you're, but 
your team is able to measure their performance because they can see how many hours they've logged, they can see what their utilization rate is and how effective they were at hitting their targets. And not just the people who are logging that time, but everybody on the team, you know, it's a, right. <laughs> it's a communication tool for everybody. Uh, and everybody can, all, like this is something that's open. I don't just do this off in my corner. The entire team can see it and, and can consult it at any time. So it's also gives a, a, a glance or an overview of agency health. Like we were supposed to, you know, the plan was to bring in $20,000 while we, you know, we only log 10 if over several months, like people are gonna know that there's a problem or, or vice versa, right? If they're seeing like every single month we're, hit, we're exceeding our projections, like that's telling them the agency's really healthy, like we're working really hard, like something great is going here. It, it, you know, it's, it's their key performance indicators essentially for the entire team. They can see their performance and how we're doing together. Um, and then the other thing is cash flow. Yeah. So those are the, the, those are the two main takeaways for you by maintaining the spreadsheet and preparing and planning. Um, would you say that would be fair assessment? Or is there anything else that I may have missed uh, that is the takeaway for investing time and effort in maintaining the spreadsheet? Uh, um, that's a question I'm asking. I, 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 I'm not challenging what you're doing. It's just that I'm asking is that or anything else I'm missing? I mean, I just talked for 45 minutes with lots of takeaways on <laughs> no. what this spreadsheet can give you. So <laughs> if that's what you took away from it, that's great. I'm happy that you took away something. Thanks. Yeah. Hi there. Uh, thanks again for sharing. That was really interesting and, and intense compared to what I do currently. So I've <laughs> got a lot of ideas. I'm curious how this kind of reflects back to reality. So you've got a really good plan. Let's say everyone's like well utilized for a couple months and then you know your client takes four weeks to approve something instead of the one that you planned for. You yeah. know, then you've got some people with overages and then some people for a couple weeks who are underutilized. Like how do you how does the balance and what you find in the spreadsheet reflect back on how you in reality deal with the clients? So well reflect back on how we deal with the clients. So what it does do is it allows us when dealing with clients, so that client that's taking four weeks to approve something, you can say, well, I'm sorry, but in four weeks, my team availability is lesser than it is now. So like I have you know, team members who are lined up and booked on these other things as you know, in my projections. And so you know, if it's gonna take four weeks, well, you may lose this person who was available and who mm -hmm. was ready. So that's one way that it can tie back into your client communication and like actual, you know, how you're running the project. Um, you're right that sometimes some things take longer, but then there's like overtime on other things. So I have found that in some instances, all of the like life happening evens out okay. and the projections still are relatively accurate, even though one thing took longer and I had to, you know, go back and say, oh, okay, well, these 40 hours I had planned are actually going to happen two weeks from now because this came up. But then in the meantime, we were really, you know, pushing to get something done on another project so there was some overtime and it just sometimes it ends up evening out and sometimes right. it doesn't and then your numbers are just off but you should know that before right. you actually pull them an invoice and then you're like oh whoa I didn't really bill as much as I thought I was going to this month because you're tracking it week over week so thank you yeah Hello. <laughs> um, thanks for the presentation. I had a question about, um, so I remember last year from your estimations talk, you talked about how you guys added 20% for project management. Mm -hmm. um, and I noticed in your sheet, you have that down at the bottom for your projections, but then you also have the project managers listed out as individuals and you're planning their time. So I don't quite understand, I didn't understand. The full team is planned. Uh, and that's just to understand like what a reasonable billable, uh, what a reasonable target is for them. But the project managers do not work with targets. So while it is kind of planning out about how much time they should be spending on, on you know, on billable work in a week and versus billable work, um, I remove them from the, for the revenue, from the profit. Yeah. From the okay. Revenue gotcha. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, they're just zeroed out. Yeah. Anybody else? Just like. 30 seconds for one question. No? All right, thank you so much for coming. Have a great day.